All right, it looks like we are at the top of the hour. So why don't we go ahead and get started with today's program. So first and foremost, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Town Hall Tuesdays. This is actually our very first installment of the virtual Town Hall series for 2020. So we're pleased that you could all join us today. Uh, my name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance. And I'd like to just take the next few minutes briefly walking you through a few details for this program. The Alliance Virtual Town Hall Series was established to highlight successful OPO and transplant program relationships and the resulting outcomes. During this particular town hall, we will be joined by Gift of Life Michigan as they discuss their practices for reintubation and ventilation of DCD donors. Now, upon joining the meeting today, you may have noticed that your audio line was muted. To ensure that we're able to hear our speakers clearly, we will keep the lines muted for the duration of the town hall presentation. That being said, if you have any questions that come up during the course of the program, we'd like to recommend that you submit them using the chat feature. For those of you who are new to the Zoom platform, the chat feature is located at the very bottom of your Zoom browser. Please note, all questions will be held for the end during our Q&A discussion. Now for anyone who may be seeking continuing education credits, please note there will be no credits offered for attending today's program. However, all of our participants are eligible to claim a certificate of attendance. Following the conclusion of today's presentation, you will receive an email with outlined instructions on how to claim your certificate. Prior to receiving your certificate, you will be asked to complete a brief online evaluation. We do highly recommend that you complete this evaluation as your feedback is invaluable to us and will help us develop future programs. If you have any issues or questions, please don't hesitate to contact a member from the Alliance team. Now, as an added note, we will be recording today's presentation. So if you or a colleague is interested in viewing this town hall at a later date, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, with that being said, at this point, I'll go ahead and get the program started by introducing our moderator, Candy Wells, Director of Organ Utilization at Life Center Northwest. Candy, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce our presenter. Thank you so much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to moderate today's session. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, Ashley's um, her overall topic, as Deanna mentioned, is we're going to discover with her how Gift of Life Michigan has been able to minimize the use of anesthesiologists um, and decrease actually the expenses by reintubating and ventilating DCD lungs um, in those donors. So Ashley Brown is the manager of Organ Clinical Services at Gift of Life Michigan, as well as a proud donor family. Um, she began her career at the OPO in a role of donation coordinator. Um, she later pursued her Master's of Science in Administration with a concentration in leadership from Central Michigan University. Um, Ashley, Ashley is passionate about maximizing efforts that take organ and tissue donation to the next level. As part of her efforts in helping promote knowledge in the OPO community, she sits on the test examination committee of the American Board of Transplant Certification. So her, if you want to go to the next slide, please, Corey. The objectives for today's presentation um, is Ashley will identify three factors needed to establish and initiate this important program. Um, she'll describe the roles and responsibilities of the OPO, hospital staff, recovery surgeon um, for this collaborative practice. Um, she'll share the cost savings realized by reintubation and ventilation of DCD donors by OPO coordinators. Um, and you'll be able to design a similar program following this presentation at your OPO. Um, next slide, please. So Ashley, could you get started and tell us a little bit about why you started this initiative at Gift of Life Michigan? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Candy, and thank you for all of you for allowing me to be here today. So the initiative began at Gift of Life Michigan as we had a prominent anesthesiology group who refused to reintubate our donation after circulatory death donors under any circumstance. And so with that being said, we knew as an OPO that we had a responsibility to the donors, the donor families, and the recipients to further vet this process internally. Next slide, please, Corey. So could you tell us a little bit about the training process? Yeah, so our training process includes our experienced team members. We are fortunate at Gift of Life Michigan to have several team members with 
previous history of intubation, whether that be through um, EMT school um, or some of our um, practice practitioners had gone to CRNA school as well. Um, so our um, team put together an anatomy and physiology course, which is followed by hands-on practice with mannequins. And then at that time, they have the opportunity to perform um, cadaveric tissue donor reintubation, as well as going on site, um, which is our ultimate goal for them to go on site um, and perform a reintubation on a donation after circulatory death donor with another experienced team member. Corey, next slide, please. Um, Ashley, there were a lot of questions about what it looks like in the clinical setting. Could you walk us through the process? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So our team members arrive on site and they perform a thorough chart review and also an airway assessment um, prior to the actual extubation of the DCD donor. So they're looking for potential difficulties that may occur during the reintubation process. They're looking at things such as the intercisor gap, looking at the patient's overall dentition status. So if they have some loose teeth, that's something that we're gonna to wanna to note prior to performing the reintubation. And then they also have multiple huddles. So that would include huddles with the donation coordinator who is on site caring for the donor and working directly with the care team um, providing care for our donor, um, as well as talking to anesthesia. So it's super important when we are um, looking at this process to have anesthesia on standby. So you never know when you might incur a difficult airway. We can do the best we can to ensure that we have all the tools in place, but you always want them to be on standby in case we do have a difficult um, situation occur. As well as talking to the OR team and letting them know that the practice will be a little bit different after the patient is pronounced that we will um, have our team perform the reintubation and assist the transplant team with whatever needs they may have. And lastly, super important to talk with the transplant surgeon and the recovery team, identify anything that they would like to see after um, clamp has occurred with mechanical ventilation um, or any recruitment maneuvers that might be necessary for them to do the actual recovery of lungs. So That's our- great, Ashley. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, I know you talked a lot about collaborative efforts. Did you meet any resistance? You know, so we were really fortunate as an OPO to have the support from the major majority of the hospitals that we serve. Um, so the hospital team has actually expressed a lot of gratitude um, as it decreases the necessity of having an anesthesia team member present or available for us, and therefore they can sit, assist with other cases. So we've been very fortunate in that manner. Um, next slide, Corey. Okay, so this case study slide represents an actual case where Gift of Life um, intubation team performed the reintubation after the declaration of death of this DCD donor. Um, so it's really important for us to note that we maintain the practice of following the hospital policies as it relates to declaration of death, in addition to any waiting periods that are required by the hospital. I wanna highlight with our process that there are no delays with our team performing the reintubation in lieu of whether that be having been the transplant team or the anesthesia team that may have um, performed that process in the past. So specifically, if you look at this case study, you'll see that our patient was pronounced at 2047. Um, you'll see that the reintubation re occurred at 2051 an incision was made at 2052. This specific hospital policy has a five minute waiting period, so we were able to accommodate that um, with no issue. Next slide, Corey. Ashley, there were also questions um, about what your results were. What were the benefits that you found from this practice? Yeah, so the benefits that we found um, overall have been um, they've been incredible. We are super proud as an OPO of the high level of appreciation we've received from our hospital partners and our transplant teams that we've served. So since initiating this process, we have attempted 35 um, DC lung recoveries. And of those, 54% of those patients did die within the DCD timeframe and lungs were recovered and transplanted. 
So we've also had an increase in satisfaction from our hospital partners. I mentioned that earlier, it decreases the time that they are spending with us waiting for that potential of that patient to expire or in the unfortunate circumstance when they don't expire in that DCD time frame. In addition to that, we've had a realization of an 87% cost savings, um, which is incredible with our team performing the reintubation in lieu of the anesthesia group. That is incredible, Ashley. Did you or have you received any direct feedback from your transplant program? Yeah, absolutely. So we do ask each of the recovering surgeons or the recovering team members to pre participate in a brief survey after we have completed the DCD lung recovery. And with that, we've had incredible scores. So we've received a 9.8 out of 10 in the area of reintubation practices and a 9.9 .9 out of 10 score in the area of ventilator management. That's great. So for OPOs that are considering um, initiating this process, what are, the, what are the things that they should consider? Yeah, I think if you have a program that is interested in um, recreating what we've been doing, um, I think the first thing you really need to do is consider the resources that you have within your own OPO. I think we are very fortunate in the OPO world to have many people who come to us with diverse backgrounds, and we need to utilize those individuals that have those diverse backgrounds. Um, I think that it's important that you're ensuring that you have a thorough program, which includes a classroom component, component as well as a didactic component, component, as well as going on site and actually performing the reintubation with your seasoned team members. Um, and above all, I think it's important that you're seeking feedback from those um, places that you're working with, whether that be the donor hospital or the transplant centers. It's very important that we learn from the feedback that they have offered us so that we can always assess what we need to do better. And in addition, I think you need to make a plan to maintain competency. So at Gift of Life, we've had several um, DCD reintubations since we started this program, but not all programs will be that fortunate to have a consistent line of DCD reintubations, and that's okay. But what do you do to ensure that your staff remains competent? Um, and on that note, as far as what, what I'm mean, looking at, what we can do more, better, and differently, can you tell us a little bit about your plans moving forward, Ashley? I mean, what are the things that you've learned, and and what will you be implementing moving forward? Yeah, so our plans moving forward, um, already in 2020, we've been off to a great start. We've had seven attempted DCD lung um, recoveries in 2020. Um, so we realized that we need to grow our internal programs. So right now we are training two additional team members to help us with this process. And we'll continue to monitor our program closely, looking for feedback from our hospital Thanks. partners and our transplant partners, Thanks. and making sure that we can continue to have the resources necessary to um, move Thank forward you. with this initiative. That's great. Um, I'm gonna ask um, for those participating today, if you have questions, to please type them into the chat function. And then I have some additional questions that were submitted prior to um, our um, webinar today that I'll get started with. And um, so Ashley, can you tell us if you've had any difficult hospitals or anesthesia staff that um, you've had challenges with since you instituted this practice? I know you mentioned um, having some challenges with anesthesia inspired the practice. Yeah, yeah. So we really have been, again, fortunate that we haven't had issues with anesthesia programs or hospitals since initiating this program. I think because our program was really derived based off the feedback of those um, anesthesia groups that are in our area, um, we have been able to go in and provide education to them in real time, let them know how the process will work, ensure that we're maintaining the care to their donors, um, maintaining the um, utmost of respect to the donors. I think that that's been really beneficial for us. That's great. It looks like we have a couple of questions already. Um, where, did, where do your estimates from anesthesia costs come from is one of the questions. Yeah, so that's a great, um, we were able to look at the hospitals in which we serve and the prominent hospitals that were charging us for our anesthesia costs prior to initiating this practice. 
So those costs come from the actual anesthesiologists themselves, as well as the equipment that we're charged for from the donor hospitals to perform this process. Um, in comparison to our gift of life staff, um, gift, of, gift of life staff costs, those are derived from our average um, pay per coordinator, in addition to us maintaining our own supplies and putting those into practice. Great, thank you, Ashley. Um, and then another question is, how, on how many cases did you have to use your standby um, anesthesia, anesthesiologist um, to step in to re-intubate? That's a wonderful question. So I will again say that it is so important to have them on standby and to do that assessment of the donor prior to doing the reintubation. We have only had one situation where we did need to tap into that resource. That patient was um, a gunshot, a self-inflicted gunshot wound. They had a lot of swelling. The airway, airway was quite difficult, and we knew in advance that we would likely. Um, need assistance with that. So our team member actually did continue to perform the reintubation, had no trouble doing it, but we had them in the room just in case. So I think it's really important to prepare um, in advance for what you might occur. That's great. And um, we have another question about um, what would your suggestions be, Ashley, um, if you were with an NOPO that didn't have anyone with that specific skill, um, like like paramedics, someone that's intubated before and you wanted to actually institute this sort of process. Yeah, I think um, reach out to your, your other OPOs. Um, I would volunteer us as well um, to, to kind of talk about it and collaborate. We would be more than happy to come and teach some of your team members to do that and help you put together a program such as this. I think then if you didn't have anyone with the specific previous background of intubating, I think you would wanna look for your strong clinical individuals, those ones who have a good strong knowledge of anatomy and physiology and um, ventilator management. Um, those with a good communication um, because that is vital in making you successful in this process. That's great. And that's really generous actually to help other OPOs too um, institute this process. And um, we have another question that relates to um, the OR itself. Do you have just one OPO staff member that has the ability to re-intubate um, in the OR, or do you have someone as a backup to them before utilizing anesthesia? That's a great question. So when our new individuals that are learning the process, um, when we first started the program, we would send two out at one time. So we'd always have two sets mm -hmm. of hands that were available. Um, as we um, performed more of these processes, we went down to one, um, but it is something that we definitely evaluate case by case. If we do think that there is a need to have an additional team member there, we will do that. Um, we also do have um, the luxury of allowing someone to be at the head of the bed, um, do the reintubation, and then flip over as a second in the OR to kind of work as a coordinator in the OR post intubation as well. But that's a great okay. question. It is a great question. Um, do you have best practice suggestions um, for effectively messaging um, this initiative to hospitals before an OPO would get started? Like, how did you begin those discussions? You know, so I think that our discussions really began with working with that in, those anesthesia groups that weren't willing to perform the process. And that was really the only hospital we had to directly develop you know, best practices and communication with them to explain why we were doing this process. So as a result of what we heard from them, we're putting together this process to be able to fill the wishes of these donors. Um, we think it'll be a great opportunity for you guys and less resource utilization. But other than that, we haven't really put together a lot of information for other centers. But that's definitely something we could look into. And if other people are looking to develop a program, we'd be happy to work with you to put that together. That's great, Ashley. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, I think this is a really great question, how you document the intubation? So where you document that information, who's doing it, um, so that that's available. Yeah, um, so documentation is super important. So we are documenting from the very beginning when we go in, uh, go on site to do our airway assessment. We're documenting that airway assessment in our electronic medical record at the OPO. Um, 
as well as documenting the um, number of attempts at the reintubation, what type of scope was utilized, what the intercisor gap was, all the anatomy details. And in addition to documenting in the hospital um, record that we did perform the reintubation of the donor. So very important question. Documentation is very important. That's great. Um, when um, there's, there's kind of a second half to the question about um, do you have more than one person go to the OR as a, as a backup? And the second half is, did you utilize any of the anesthesia groups um, for assistance with training your staff? In training your staff, um, this individual in their previous RT role, anesthesia actually did um, their intubation training when they were in RT. Yeah, that's a great question. So we did explore that option of having outside individuals come in to assist us with um, the training of our, our team members. Um, but again, we were very fortunate with having um, a specific coordinator on our team who had gone to CRNA school, so had a lot of experience with participation from that, as well as several medics on our teams that have performed hundreds of reintubation. So we chose to go with just our internal team members, but I definitely think if it's something you're considering for your program, it would be um, a great idea to partner with those that would be willing to do so for you. I think that's a great learning experience. They have probably performed thousands of intubations over the years, and I think that's a great resource mm -hmm. to tap into. I agree. Um, let me know if there are any other questions. Please type them in those that are participating. Okay, here we go. Here's another question. Um, has your team investigated the viability of super um, glottic airway devices or blind insertion airway devices over intubation? We have not. Um, I I am not aware of any research that we've done in that. And if think if the person that posed that question, if you guys do have any information about that that you could share with us we would love to learn more and look into that great thank you um any other questions um i have a um as as folks are thinking i have a couple more that were submitted and um, that we can chat about um were there any pitfalls in and around communication needs or expectations with anesthesia when you started this process um no. Um, so the question, did we have any pitfalls? Um, no, we didn't have any pitfalls with the communication with our anesthesia team members. I think that goes back to the requirement of the huddle and just communication, communication, communication. So, Absolutely. Over communication is always great, right? It's usually the right spot. Um, there was a question related to APRV with DCD lungs and whether or not your program had any experience with APRV. Yeah, so we, with the donation after circulatory death donor, because it is not a donor that we are managing, rather the hospital is managing that donor up until the time of death, we do not have a lot of experience or any experience, I guess you would say, with APRV in the donation after circulatory death donor. So just kind of that hands-off piece until after um, declaration or pronouncement of the patient. Great, Ashley. And at our OPO, our, our experience is similar. Are there any other questions? I know we have two more minutes. If there aren't, um, okay, we have another question that came in. Um, do you utilize hospital RT for intubation assistance and transport vent after reintubation, or do you utilize the anesthesia vent? Um, so we um, utilize the anesthesia vent, um, but we also do have a portable ventilator that we have um, available that we can bring on site with us. So it is similar to a transport vent that we um, will pack up. So we have an intubation kit um, that includes all of the supplies that are necessary for our team members to perform the reintubation. Um, so that is the equipment that we would utilize. But you definitely, I think if you have good collaboration with your hospital, um, could obtain the supplies from your hospital if they're willing to do so or continue to use the anesthesia vent. That's great. That's a great question. I think that's all of the questions at this moment. We have one more minute if there are any last minute questions.
I don't see any additional questions, Deanna. All right. Well, thank you uh, both. It looks like if there are no questions, I'm just going to let this trickle for just another second here. But um, if that is the last of the questions, that will um, conclude our Q&A discussion and therefore our town hall presentation for today. So on behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to Ashley and Candy for such a fantastic discussion on the new DC practices that have been implemented by your organization, Gift of Life Michigan. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say the information shared has been very informative. And so we appreciate your participation for sharing your personal experiences. Um, to all of our participants, we hope you found today's presentation valuable and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Enjoy your day, everyone.